Good morning, everyone. We started the day and hoping that it would not rain. But apparently, it is raining. How are you doing this morning? Anybody sleepy? Okay. You can take a five-minute nap while I talk, as long as your ears are listening. This morning, we want to take a few minutes to answer some questions that we got yesterday morning after the morning session and some questions that we got after the afternoon session. So the first question, I try to paraphrase the question. The first question is about how to stop sinning. How can we stop sinning when we are already numb? I think the question came about because of the illustration of the wolf. When our heart is already numb, when we continue doing the sin over and over again, we get used to it. How can we stop sinning when we get used to it? For sure, we are not like the wolf. Even though we sin over and over, we still have an opportunity to stop. Unlike the wolf, swallowing his own blood, then he gradually died. But for us, there is still an opportunity to stop. Because if we really want to follow Jesus, John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then another passage from Galatians 5, 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And most especially, there's a passage in the Old Testament that tells us, if we want to stop from doing what we keep on doing over and over again, then this is the promise. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 68. You can read the whole chapter, but I just want to read you the first part. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. When you go home, keep in mind, try to read Deuteronomy 28. And if you will see, the blessings are, are, are given in the following, in the verses after that. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field, and it goes on. And so, for us, I don't think that we will come up to the point, just like the wolf, that we cannot really stop, that we cannot really stop from doing wrong. Because God will still have given opportunities for us. Maybe there will be reminders from your friends, there will be reminders from your teachers, there will be reminders from your parents, and it will help us to stop from what we are doing, from what is making us numb. Because we have to remember, numb does not mean dead, right? Numb does not mean dead. Numb means that you are already getting used to it. If your feet get numb, it has cramps when you sit too long, then you oh, you cannot feel your feet anymore. You stretch it, the blood will circulate again, and there you go. It goes back to normal. So this is a kind of illustration that I want to illustrate. Or that we can stop sinning because there are promises in the Bible that will enable us to stop doing what is wrong and turn back to what is right. Okay, the next one. Okay, there you go. There was a question that asked about God being an envious God. How can a God be envious? And this is referring to 
Exodus 20, verse 5. Okay, let's read that. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. What do you think the jealousy of God is like? Is it the jealousy of a boyfriend to a girlfriend or a husband to a wife? No, then what kind of jealousy is it then? For sure, we have to remember that this jealousy involves him being in love with us, shall we say. Because he loves us so, because he has created us, because he has given all these things to us, and he has made a covenant. The main thing here is that because he has made a covenant that we will become his people. That is why there is a love relationship here to make us understand. But the kind of love relationship here is not like a human love. The jealousy that is being explained here is kana, which is explained in Hebrew, jealousy that is only referred to God. In the Bible, in the Hebrew words, in the Hebrew language, whenever they refer to jealousy for humans, they do not use the word kana. They use the word piel. I'm, I just wish that we can all read Hebrew no? and we can understand the usage of words. But since we read in English or in Tagalog, let us just keep this in mind. That there is a distinction between the jealousy of God that is explained in the Bible because of the root word in original language. The jealousy stated in Exodus 20 verse 5 is referring to the jealousy of God who has made a covenant with us and doesn't want us to break that covenant. That's why he is jealous of us. Because God is speaking of people making idols and bowing down and worshiping these idols instead of giving God the worship that belongs to Him. God is possessive of the worship and service that belong to Him. It is a sin to worship or serve anything other than God. That's another explanation also. Okay? So I hope this satisfies the question of jealousy, of envy. Okay, hold on. We will take care of this. The next, the next question that we have is about the passage. The passage that is found in 1 John 1 verse 9. One of you asked this question. The passage here says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the question is, if we, if we do sin, we confess, we do sin again, we will confess again. We will do it again. Then we will confess. Seriously speaking, if you are doing that, if you are doing that on a daily basis, intentionally, don't you think that is just like playing with God? Right? You know it is a sin, but since you hold this passage, oh God will, if I confess, God will forgive me. So you, you keep on doing anyway, we'll confess. And then God will forgive us. Shall we hold on to this passage? The answer is no. We should not use this passage to do sin, ask forgiveness. Do sin, ask forgiveness. Intentionally. Okay? It is not biblical for a person to sin habitually and continually as a lifestyle. And still be a believer. 1 John 3 Verses 8 to 9. And that is why Paul admonishes us to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Okay? So, I do not suggest that we will use this passage as 
something that we can hold on that although we will sin and sin and sin and sin and sin do do something that is that we know is a sin keep on doing it anyway god will forgive us do not use this passage do not use this passage okay okay we come to the next question who is with us when we give in to temptations who is with us well somebody some of us will say yeah god will be with us but does he go with us when we are when we when we give in to the temptation no definitely when you give in to your to the temptations that you face god does not be with you in that in that decision because we have to understand that temptations does not come from god it comes from satan let us look at this first peter 5 verse 8 it says be sober vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walk about seeking whom he may devour so the opportunity he's looking for opportunity to devour us by offering us many kinds of things romans 12 verse 2 says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let god transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know god's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect okay i hope this answers that question okay another question what attitude is most important since uh, it did not signify which particular attitude i just assume that there are two kinds of attitude a good attitude positive attitude and negative attitude and so a good or positive attitude is the most important from us if we look at the definition from the dictionary attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling typically reflected in a person's behavior and so philippians 4 verse 13 says i can do all things through christ which strengthens me so if our our thinking or feeling is set in christ we can do a positive behavior because it will be enabled through christ proverbs 4 33 says keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are found the issue of life for as a man thinketh in his heart so is he proverbs 23 verse 7 so positive attitude and probably you can define it yourself what are the positive attitudes okay okay do you see okay there is oh this is is it going back oh yeah it goes back there you go okay there's one more question from an adventist uh is it a sin if you accidentally eat pork when we are not supposed to eat for pork now i will i will just ask this question when you go to all fast food in the philippines you go to jollibee you go to mcdonald's probably they already have a kind of system of halal which means that they don't cook pork in their kitchen but if you go to sm food courts you go to sm food courts or you go in other restaurants uh, such like such as um tokyo tokyo or anything that will that in their menu provides a barbecue pork and a barbecue chicken when you order how do you know that the chicken that you are eating was not cooked on the same grill that the meat that the pork was cooked in do you think they have separate cooking cooking utensils to do that so if it is meat pork that they put on the grill they don't wash it off because the next order will be meat or chicken and then the next one will be pork so if with this knowledge that means you are actually eating portions milliliters or grams of pork no 
You're eating that. So, the question is, if you do not know, if you do not know, is it a sin? Well, if there is no light given to you about something that is wrong, and you, you do it at that time, and then you realize it later that it is wrong, then I don't think that is a sin because it was unintentional because you were not given the information. You did not know. But if you know that there is, that it is pork, that there is a possibility that you will eat pork, then I suggest you better refrain from doing it. Okay? Just refrain from doing it. And uh, next, this is very important. Hosea 2 verse 11 says, Sabbath is done away. I will put an end to all her gaiety, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festal assemblies. Because this passage said that God has put an end to Sabbath, why do we still keep the Sabbath holy? Why do we still need to, to go to church on Sabbath? Why don't we just go to church on Sunday, just like all the other Christian denomination does? Okay, first of all, we need to know, we need to understand, is that there are two kinds of Sabbaths for the, that is being practiced by the Israelites. The first Sabbath is the weekly Sabbath. The weekly Sabbath as such as found in Exodus 20 verse 8. And then there is the festival sab Sabbath, which is a yearly Sabbath. It is an annual biblical festival called by the name of Mikra. Serve as supplemental testimonies to the plan of Sabbath. You can find this kind of Sabbath being described in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And there is also a sabbatical year. So there is one that is weekly, one that is annually, and one every seven years. The sabbatical year is the seventh year of the seven-year agricultural mandated in the Torah for the land of Israel. Okay? So there are three kinds of Sabbath. Now let us find out if the Sabbath that Hosea 2 verse 11 is talking about the weekly Sabbath. Because you look at this. I will put an end to all her gaiety. Feasts, new moons, Sabbaths. These are all festivals. These are all religious festivals. God said He will put an end to these religious festivals. If it is a re religious festival, does it mean the seventh, seventh day Sabbath? Is it also a festival or is it a holiday that is being set aside by God? What do you think? Is the seventh day Sabbath a festival, a ceremony, or is it a seventh day Sabbath that is being set aside as a holy day so that we can worship God? Okay? It is a holy day, not a ceremony day. Because if it is a ceremony, then there will be other kinds of preparation that should be done similar to feasts her new mo new moons and everything another explanation is the use of my sabbaths my day or as belonging to yahweh in the bible is used to refer to the weekly sabbath okay while your sabbaths and her sabbaths refer only to the yearly or year-long sabbath okay the yearly the annual sabbath and the sabbatical sabbath since the day of atonement is called your Sabbath, that her Sabbaths in your Hosea too must be yearly and not weekly. Okay. I hope that answers our question. Okay. Yeah. So we are going to our study this morning. And I hope that these questions that has been asked and I have tried to answer can bring new uh, knowledge and it can help you increase your spiritual life. If you, if you wish to ask more questions, today I will again be in the guidance office. 
after after the week of prayer i will be there immediately so you are free to come and ask more questions okay shall we bow our heads for prayer before we start loving father in heaven we thank you that this morning you have led us once again to worship you and to study your word please give us the holy spirit to open our hearts to open our minds so we will understand our lesson today thank you for hearing our prayer in jesus name amen our topic today is an attitude of gratitude if we open our bibles in second corinthians 4 verses 15 to 16 it says all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. This is what Apostle Paul wants us to experience. Experience the grace that reaches more and more people. One day, little Jojo started to pray. And in his prayer, he said, Dear Jesus, we thank you for the beautiful day. We thank you for my mama and papa. And I thank you also for my kuya and my ate. And please bless this food. And they were thinking, his family was thinking, he was going to say, Amen. But no. Instead, he continued, Please bless this food that you have given us. Please bless the kamote. Please bless the rice. Please bless the daing. Please bless... Ate who has cooked the food, please bless the garden where the food grows. Oh, and he goes on and on and on and on. But you see, I think sometimes this is the way that we should pray, just like a little child. We have to be thankful for everything that we can have our mouths to say to the Lord because if we count sometimes we do not have enough attitude of gratitude that we give to the Lord no matter what day is like no matter how stressed out or strained we feel the greatest moment of worship we will ever experience are those that are marked by Grace, grateful praise to God. There is a saying that a grateful heart is like an evergreen tree. Why do you think an evergreen tree is called an evergreen tree? Because it is always green all year round. No matter what the weather is or what the season is, it will stay green. It will not change color like other plants. What would it be like to be around believers or friends who are always thankful to the Lord? What will it be like? No matter what the circumstances, what do you think it will be like? There is a story of an African king. He had a close friend who he grew up with. And the friend had a habit at every situation that ever occurred in his life. Whether positive or negative, he will always say, this is good. One day, the king and his friend went out on a hunting expedition. And his friend would faithfully load the gun and give to the king. But after several shots, the friend made a mistake in loading the gun. 
And so as the king pulled the trigger, instead of firing forward, it backfired and the king's thumb was blown off. The king was so furious. He, said, he told his men, look what you did. But the friend, because of his, he is accustomed to saying this, he said, this is good. And the king said, no, this is not good. And he put his friend to jail. About a year later, the king was hunting in an arena that should have known to stay clear of, of his enemies. But he was captured. And his enemies were still cannibals. And so they brought him, they tied him up, they brought him to their village ready to feast on him because they have caught a prize, a king. They brought him there, and as they were about to start the process of cooking the king, one of them realized that the king has a thumb missing. And they said, oh, we should not eat this. He is not a full person because of their belief that they should eat a full person. And so they let him go. They said, we will not eat you. So the king, looking back, he said, maybe my friend was correct. This is good. Having no more thumb is good. So he went to his friend. He said, he hugged his friend. He said, my friend, you are right. This is good. No thumb is good. And his friend said, praise the Lord. This is good. You will release me. In all situations, this friend always say, this is good. And so it is with us. We are asked, to always have this kind of attitude. Even though what happens to us, we will always praise the Lord. Whether we are pressed, whether we are perplexed, whether we are persecuted, whether we are struck down, if we have this attitude of always showing thanksgiving and looking at negative things positively, then it will really become a benefit for us. It will really become a benefit for our friends that are around us. And for sure, we will enjoy this benefit. As Apostle Paul wrote this passage, he had in his mind that the people in Corinth, they need to know about this. The church in Corinth endured a multitude of problems that would normally crush the joy out of the community of his people and so paul challenges them to aim their eyes their eyes higher in grateful praise to god to receive the blessings beyond circumstances there was also an instance about jesus when he was going into a village 10 men had leprosy with him met him they stood at the distance and called out in a loud voice jesus master have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were healed. They were cleansed. And one of them noticed that he was healed. He came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the nine? No one found to return again and give praise to God except this foreigner. Out of the ten, nine were Jews. One was a Samaritan. And only the Samaritan expressed his thanksgiving to Jesus. So it is important to notice that all the ten lepers cried to Jesus for help. And on the borders of Gentile land, this mixed band of social outcasts, they needed to have the healing power that only Jesus can give. They begged Jesus, heal us. But only one came back. Only one came back. The important element of this story of this one leper is that this one leper saw that he has been healed. Do you think the other nine, they didn't notice that they were being healed? 
I think the other nine also noticed. But the word used in this story means more than just to notice something. The word that was used in this story means to perceive. It suggests that the one leaper went beyond seeing and understanding the significance of the miracle. Because when the leper understood what happened to him, he was filled with praise. The other nine may have noticed, but they did not linger long enough to reflect on the miracle. The one leper returned personally and gave thanks to the healer. And Jesus' big question, where are the other nine? Ellen White, in The Desire of Ages, page 348, says, He has given all the riches of heaven to redeem them. And yet they were unmindful of His great love. But their ingratitude, they closed their hearts against the grace of God. Maybe the Savior also wonders. He wonders why only a small portion of his people daily give praise to him. Why? Where are the worshipers? Where are the one who comes with hearts full of thanksgiving? Where are the believers who are overwhelmed with gratitude? Where are the people who are so deeply touched by mercy at Calvary that the redemption theme is the one that they are talking about? Where are those people whose lives have been transformed by the truth of the gospel? Where are the children of God who complain only of the lack of words to express the love they feel to God for what He has done for Him? You know, when we consider all these things, the people get passionate about. Do you see Thanksgiving as one of those things? You know, I have experienced this. How people show Thanksgiving. One day I was on a bus from Manila. And somewhere in Dasmariñas, a man came up and he asked permission to the driver to talk. And he started explaining that his son is now in the hospital. His son needs to have a surgery. And he is asking if the passengers can contribute something for his son. So, he started going around with his hat. He removed his cap and he started going around asking for donations. At the time he reached my seat, I was, I was touched by him, by his, by his plea for help. So, I was thinking, I actually wanted to stop by Jollibee before I go home because I was so hungry. And I think I had already set aside 100 pesos for me to eat. But I look at this man, he looks so sincere because you can sometimes see that somebody is just wanting to make money out of you. So as when he approached me, I was deciding, should I give the 100 pesos to him or should I continue with my plan to eat in Jollibee? So against, against the desires of my stomach, I put my hand in my pocket and got the 100 pesos and I gave it to him. And I just put it there. And as soon as he realized it was 100 pesos, while all the rest were 1 peso, there were 5 pesos, he came back to me. And then he, he did like this to me. And then he hugged me. He said, Maraming salamat, brother. May God bless you. And when I looked at him, he was crying. I think that is the kind of gratitude that sometimes we need to show God. You know, because we take things for granted, sometimes the ordinary things in life, we do not count as blessing. And so this is what God wants us to do. Just like the illustration of the leapers. Only one came back, but he is, he is waiting for all the nine, all the ten leapers to actually come and say, thank you, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for healing me. And this is what he wants us to do. That we, to be identified as followers of Christ, 
we should continually show our gratitude to God. These things we can think about. Think of the things that you do. That is why you get help. That is why you gave help. Think of the things you do. That is why you have food. Think of all the things in life. That is why you can have good parents. Think of the things that you're, you are given the opportunity to have this kind of parents so that you can have proper education. And this is also what Paul wanted to ex communicate to the church in Corinth. Paul modeled the thanksgiving when he gave thanks to food. Paul was thankful for the faith of the Christians, Romans 1 verse 8. He thanked God for those who were converted to the faith, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4. He thanked God for the monetary support that came to him from other Christians. And he gave this as a model so that the early Christians can also give their praises and thanksgiving to God. And so, when we think of things that you are be thankful of, it can become a healthy routine. It can become a habit that we do every day. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, let us try to do this. Let us try to always think of the things that we should be thankful for. That is why I am happy that for the last few days, we have started this conversational prayer, the Acts prayer. And in each section, we are encouraged to express to Jesus how we feel about praising Him, how, how we feel about thanking Him, and how we feel of the need to ask from the Lord. And I like this. And I hope that this, this, pray, this kind of prayer, we can bring also into, the, into our daily life. In the morning, we pray with the acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And so, Mrs. White once again says, It is for our own benefit to keep every gift of God fresh in our memory. Thus, faith strengthened to claim and receive more and more. There is greater encouragement for us in the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts we can read of the faith and experience to others. Matthew Henry, a Bible commentator, he wrote the Matthew Henry Bible Commentary. He was once robbed by a band of thieves. And he responded by saying the following, Let me be thankful first, because I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, although they took my all, it was not much. Fourth, because I was robbed and not the robber. God has truly been good to me. You see this kind of positive look, outlook to negative circumstances. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to give praise to God when we are experiencing difficulty. You know, I was very sad yesterday when I was in the guidance office and then I opened my Facebook and I found out that one of my church members passed away. He was on his way from, he came from his workplace, which was around one hour flight in a mining company in an island of Manado. He came to Manado 
to make final preparations for his wedding on September 5. He came to Manado. He took pictures. Usually, in Manado, we are fond of taking pre-wedding pictures. He took pictures for the pre-wedding pictures. And then he did the preparations for the wedding with his fiance. And then, he had to go back for another three weeks of work and then one week of off work. The helicopter that he boarded with nine other passengers apparently lost contact with their flight center. And few hours later, they confirmed that the helicopter fell in the mountain. It crashed. And so I was still hoping when I read, I was hoping, Lord, please help him be alive. When I went home last night, I checked again the emails and Facebook. And there in my email, there was a link to a newspaper in Manado confirming that my friend Roy was one of the dead. One survived, and it was not him. And so at this particular time such as this, what do you think can his fiancé, who will be married in less than a month, say? Can he say, praise God, my fiancé is dead? Do you think he, she will do that? No. But my dear friends, Sometimes when we are grieving, when we are experiencing something sad, we will have doubts about God. How? How can God be good when He allowed these things to happen? But you see, looking at these experiences that we have shared, looking at these experiences, we can actually still have that attitude of gratitude even though we are put in such situations. You know, I have, I have never lost a loved one. My parents are still alive and well. I have lost my grandparents, but they were, I, I did not really feel that I was very close with them. Probably the time when I will say that I'm really grieving is probably when I lost my loved ones, my parents or my, my uh, family members. And so I also ask the question, what? What will I do? How will I say thanks to God if one of my loved ones passed away? But I tell you, my young friends, it is not impossible. It is not impossible because we have faith in Jesus. We have faith in Jesus. That although our circumstances put us in such a way that we may even curse God, there is always the Holy Spirit that will lead us and help us to look beyond what is happening, to look beyond and understand and perceive that God is still with us. Therefore, we can be thankful to God. And so in closing, I want to share with you a story of that was written by Corey Ten Boom. Have you heard of this name? Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was one of the survivors of the Holocaust in Germany. I think you are aware of the Holocaust, right? Holy Corey Ten Boom, along with her family, all the people that she loved, all the Jews in Germany, and in the surrounding European counties, they were rounded up during the Holocaust. And they were brought to concentration camps. And in the concentration camps, they will be treated like animals. Because at that time, Hitler wanted to clean out the inferior nations so that the Aryan race will be superior so they don't want the jews so when the people were put in concentration camps they were treated like animals and then batch by batch they are put into gas 
guest rooms. They will be asked to remove their clothes. They will go inside the room. And then they were told, you're going to have a bath. And they will turn on the gas and they will die. Cory Ten Boom was one of the survivors. These people, they were treated like animals. And they have every reason to complain to God. But listen to this. Cory and her sister Betty, they were brought into the camp. And they had just been transferred to the worst German prison camp they had yet seen. Ravensbrück. On entering the barracks, they found them to be extremely overcrowded and flea infested. That morning, their scripture reading in 1 Thessalonians had reminded them to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks to all circumstances. And Betty, Corey's sister, told Corey, why don't we stop and thank the Lord? for every detail of their new living quarters. And at that particular moment, Corey said, What? We want to thank God because of this flea-infested room. We want to thank God that we are crammed here like sardines. He said, No, I don't want to thank God for the fleas. But finally, she succumbed to Betsy's request. During the month they spent at the camp, they were surprised to find out how openly they could hold Bible study and prayer meetings without guard interference. It was not until several months later that they learned the reason the guards would not enter the barracks was because of the fleas. Was because of the fleas. And so this morning, as we end, can you, can you thank God for the pain you feel because it reminds you to cling to Him? Can you thank God for the little things like the fish and the flowers and the precious gift of good friends? Can we, as an academy, lift our hearts in thankfulness to God every minute of the day because someone around the world just surrendered his heart to God and became a member of God's worldwide family? I believe we want to take this opportunity to thank God for everything. Later on as we pray, let us continue this exercise. When it, when it is time for thanksgiving, please do not be hesitant to say what is in your heart that you want to be thankful for. Do not just say, thank you for the blessings. It is very general. Say it out loud to your group. What in particular are you thankful for this morning? You may even say, God, thank you because I have pimples. God, thank you. I have toothache. You know, because as of this now, we only see, we only notice. But what does the example of the leper say? We need to perceive, we need to look beyond what we actually notice. And I believe God will be happy because He will hear this attitude of gratitude that is being formed among us as young people. And so, my dear friends, this is really an opportunity for us to identify ourselves in Christ as His children, as Christians who continually give thanks to Him no matter of what we do. How many of you would like to pray with me. How many of you would like to indicate that you are willing to do this? That you want to make this a healthy habit, an attitude of gratitude to God? Let me see your hands. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And so this morning before we close, 
I want to call again on our friends. I have done this yesterday. But I want to repeat this again. Some of us have stood up yesterday to acknowledge my call for baptism. This morning, I want to extend that call again. If you have stood up yesterday and you still feel that desire to accept Jesus as your personal Savior through baptism, please stand in your seats right now. Please stand. And for those who are still struggling, struggling, uh, you are still not sure, do I want to accept Jesus at my young age through baptism? Let me tell you, that throughout this week, we have learned all this kind, all these attitudes, all these characteristics that we can apply in our daily lives. So we can be equipped to be Christians, to be God's children. If you are still not sure, do not worry. Because we have seen that God is all-powerful. And He longs us to be identified as His children. And so, I want to invite you to please stand if you want to take this step to be baptized. Thank you. Are there any more? Yes. Thank you. And so, we are going to end tomorrow. We're going to end tomorrow. We have one more topic tonight and another one tomorrow. And I am very thankful because as young people, we have always shown, we have always taken the stand whenever I call for prayer. You have always taken the stand to stand up and pray with me. And I believe our experience that we have done this week is something that will be meaningful in our lives. That will be meaningful in our lives. May I request those who have stand up to come forward. We're going to pray once again. Please come forward. We're going to pray. <coughs> May I ask our friends on the benches to please stand as we pray together. Thank you. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that this morning we have been reminded to develop an attitude of gratitude. That no matter what circumstances we face in our lives, we should have this ability to thank you for the things that you have given us. I know that the sufferings that we may experience may be a result of our carelessness, may be a result of Satan that is trying to put us down. And therefore, Help us so that we can always look through all situations and thank you. And in a special way this morning, our friends have taken a stand to be baptized, to join into the fellowship of God's children who has made Jesus as their personal Savior. Bless my dear friends who are in front with me right now. That you may give them the ability to stay hold in their decision until the time they will enter into the waters of baptism. At this moment, I pray that you will give them peace, that you will guide them continually from now on so that they can always continue to become your children. Maybe for some of us, it will be a difficult 
decision. We may be rejected by our family. Or in many ways, we will face difficulties because we want to follow you and make you our personal Savior. And so please guide them. Keep them in your care so that they will really enjoy this experience of salvation. And so with our other friends, maybe some of them also are hesitant to take this decision. I want to take this one minute to wait for them to come forward. Yes, some of you may be in the valley of decision whether you want to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. But you see, the benefits of being God's children are so many. God's grace is always abundant and sufficient for each one of us. Although we may face difficulties in our life, but because we are God's children, that we identify Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. He will never let us go. Thank you, dear Father. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. And thank you for the souls that have stepped forward and indicated their desire to accept you. Accept us. Accept us as we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.